Pride High, Book Four, Green. Written by J. Bell. Narrated by Talia Carver. Chapter One. August 31st, 1993. Lights twinkled below like little stars fallen from the sky as Ricky leaned his head against the acrylic window of the airplane. The last vestiges of the setting sun had set the horizon aglow with a blur of magenta, leaving just enough radiance to see the plains of Kansas. He was almost home, and yet his frustration only increased, as it had all summer, because they were still so far apart. Taxiing to the gate, an hour-long drive to the town of Pride, and then a massive gulf that he was supposed to leap over somehow. So much stood between him and Diego, thousands of miles, despite the illusion of nearness, because for the past three months Ricky hadn't heard a single peep from his boyfriend, or perhaps, more accurately, his ex. Ricky wasn't sure. His stomach twisted up with anxiety. None of the letters he'd written to Diego had elicited a reply. Ricky had put everything into them that he could think of. Apologies, long-winded explanations, declarations of love, promises to never make the same mistake again. Over and over again he'd tried, but to no avail. He wasn't even sure that Diego had received the letters. Maybe they had been read and thrown away by some cruel warden, or whoever was in charge of the youth detention center. His mouth went dry as he tried to envision Diego in such a dreadful place. Ricky had suffered countless nightmares over the summer. In them, he'd seen inmates sneak up on Diego from behind with shivs and clenched fists. Ricky would always cry out, wanting to warn him, but Diego never heard or even looked in his direction. Ricky was powerless each time, only able to watch as some horrible fate befell the man he loved. He had even asked his friends, his voice shaking over the phone, if Diego was okay. He still remembered how long Mindy had paused before wordlessly handing the phone to Cameron, who had been ridiculously upbeat in his equally vague response. They were hiding something from him. Ricky was certain of that. And now he was about to find out what. Except not, really, because even once the wheels of the aircraft touched down, everything seemed to take an eternity. By the time he was allowed to unbuckle his seatbelt and stand up, the sky had grown dark. Considering how long the days still were, this was a ridiculously late flight. By design, no doubt, because tomorrow was his first day of school. His mother must have planned it that way when she booked his return trip. She had wanted to ensure he wouldn't have the opportunity to see Diego, both when forcing Ricky to stay with his grandparents for the summer and when he returned home. The injustice of that made his blood boil. Oh, well. He'd get his way soon enough. His mother wouldn't be able to keep them apart tomorrow. Only one person had that power, and nobody could tell Diego what to do. He was the type of guy who would break out of jail just to call Ricky from the closest payphone to let him know that nothing had changed. I love you, Ricky. Diego had spoken those words like a promise. So why hadn't he done something? Even if he was locked up too tight to escape, he could have gotten a message to him through Mindy somehow, or an inmate who was released sooner than him. A letter, or a collect call, or even a freaking fax. Anything. Ricky swallowed as he shuffled down the airplane aisle to disembark. Maybe his own words were to blame. I'm scared. I want to go home. That hadn't been the end of it. Diego came back to him, even though it led to his capture. And now, all the waiting and wondering was pure torture. Just a little longer, then he would know the truth, for better or for worse. Ricky walked through the jet bridge and into Kansas City International Airport. He saw his parents waiting for him near the gate and felt hatred rise up in response. If he didn't need a ride, he'd turn his back and walk the hell away from them. Maybe he would anyway. Anthony could come pick him up instead, or maybe Cameron. Ugh, too late. His parents had rushed over to him. Riku! Amy cried emotionally. He refused to think of her as his mother anymore. 
She would be Amy from now on, and his father would be Ken. He'd keep it cold and impersonal, business only. I missed you so much, she blubbered, wrapping her arms around him. Ricky kept his own locked at his sides. That was the plan, at least. The familiar comfort of his mother, from the way her body felt as she squeezed him close to her reassuring scent, broke down his defenses. Ricky felt his anger drain away, leaving him small and vulnerable as he whimpered in response. Oh, I missed you so much, his mother said, planting a series of kisses in his hair and on his cheeks. Let me look at you, she said, pulling back to do just that. You've gotten so big, you're the spitting image of your father, she turned to Ken. Isn't he? He's very handsome, Ken said with a warm smile. Welcome home, son. Ricky was pulled into his arms next and gave up his plan to hold a grudge. He loved his parents too much, and it was obvious that they loved him, even though they had ruined everything. Except that wasn't quite true. Sure, he could blame them for forbidding him to see Diego and for calling the cops when he showed up on their doorstep, but if he was honest, even then he'd still had a choice. He should have grabbed Diego's hand and run for his car. They could have escaped together. I'm scared. I want to go home. Ricky tried to push the thought from his mind. Anger was useful in that regard. When he had a target to focus on, it meant he didn't have to look inward. How was the trip to Disneyland? Ken asked. I know what you said on the phone, but I want details. Did you make a list of the rides you went on like I asked? Yeah, Ricky said. Grandpa didn't want to go on any of them, but Grandma did. She was in the Air Force, Ken said, putting an arm around Ricky as they waited in front of the baggage carousel. I bet a roller coaster can't compete with shooting across the ocean in an F-15. She said the loop-de-loops are nothing compared to the G-forces of actually flying upside down. Ricky murmured without much enthusiasm. His grandma was cool, but there was a burning question he was dying to ask. Ricky clamped down on the urge. He didn't want to push his luck. Not yet, anyway. So he made small talk with his parents while collecting his baggage and on the walk to the car. But when he was buckled up in the back seat, he couldn't take it anymore. Did I get any mail while I was gone? He asked. Like letters from people I know? I don't think so. Amy said. Oh, did anyone call? His mother turned around to look at him in concern. No, all your friends were aware that you'd be out of town. Why would they call? I don't know. He licked dry lips. I thought Diego might have stopped by or something. Now that he's out, I mean. I'm afraid not. Amy faced forward again. Have you eaten? Are you hungry? Nothing at all, Ricky pressed. You would tell me, wouldn't you? His father's eyes met his in the rearview mirror. We would tell you, son. Now answer your mother. I'm not hungry, Ricky said, slumping down in his seat despite trying to keep his spirits up. Diego was no fool. He knew that Ricky's parents didn't want them to be together, so of course he hadn't left a message with them. Although he also didn't give a shit what anyone thought, so it would have been possible. Ricky didn't bring up the subject again. The waiting and wondering continued, followed by restlessness when they pulled into a quaint town devoid of the usual sprawl of chain restaurants and strip malls. The businesses were local, and often just as quirky as the brick road, red, not yellow, that was Main Street. Ricky's attention locked on to one of the bars in particular. He hoped to spot a Trans Am with mismatched panels parked outside, and strained his neck to see into the interior just in case a hunky guy in a leather jacket was kicking back a beer while playing darts. No luck either way. He sighed and gave up the hunt, but only for now. Ricky tried to play it cool when they finally reached his house. He barely blinked an eye when his mother said, you're home for the night, okay? Yeah, I'm tired from the flight anyway. 
He hung out with his parents and ate when his mother insisted. Eventually, he was able to go up to his room for some much-needed privacy. Ricky flicked on the light. He checked under the bed, where he'd once found Diego hiding, and then in the closet, but no luck. Ricky was alone. He grabbed the phone and dialed a number that he knew by heart, Diego's pager. He left his own number as the message and hung up. Ricky bit his nails, waiting for the phone to ring. He paced his room, threw himself on his bed, and bounced back out again a minute later to check the clock. Thirty grueling minutes. Diego never took that long to call him back. Maybe he was on his way over. Ricky went downstairs, listening carefully to make sure his parents were occupied and wouldn't notice. Then he slipped out the front door and plopped down on the steps there, leaving enough room for someone to sit next to him. Just like when Diego had shown up out of the blue so that Ricky wouldn't take the fall for a stupid prank that had spiraled out of control. The details didn't matter to him, not as much as the memories that filled his mind. Deciding to run away together, meeting Diego in a cave filled with candles, making love on a sleeping bag, the reassurance of being held afterward. Ricky had felt that they'd become one person, like they could never be parted again. And maybe they wouldn't have, after beginning their new life together in El Paso. Except, I'm scared, I want to go home. Ricky had chickened out, and bailed on someone who had been abandoned by his father, his best friends, and even his mother. The guilt was overwhelming, as was the growing certainty that Diego wasn't going to call him back. His car wouldn't roar down the street to whisk him away. Ricky had broken Diego's heart and ruined everything they'd had together. He sat there on the front stoop, listening to insects hum in the dying heat. Eventually, the door behind him opened. He looked over his shoulder and saw his father standing there with a surprised expression. Did someone call me? Ricky asked. Not that I know of, Ken replied. Did you hear my phone ring? No. Ken quietly shut the door behind him. Then he sat next to Ricky on the stoop. He didn't say anything, not at first. He simply stared up at the late August sky before sighing. Your mother doesn't want you to see him, Ricky swallowed. I know. You're growing up so quickly, his father said, voice tinged with sorrow. Which makes me feel old. But at the same time, I swear I was your age not that long ago. I remember how it felt. Did it hurt? Ricky asked around the lump in his throat. Sometimes. But looking back, things were never as bad as they seemed in the moment. Ricky shook his head. You don't understand. No, you don't understand, Ken said, bumping shoulders with him playfully. But you will. Someday. A comfortable silence settled between them as they sat there, taking in the night. You wouldn't believe how many chances your mother has given me, Ken said eventually, seemingly at random. If this guy is the right one for you, his father shrugged, then he nodded to the heavens. Otherwise, it's a great big universe. Do you know how many stars are in our galaxy alone? Even if you pare it down to those that could potentially have planets orbiting them. Ricky snorted. I've heard the other fish in the sea lecture before. Don't I at least get points for originality? Ken asked with a wink. He stood and brushed himself off. Want to go inside and see what's on TV? I'll be there soon, Ricky promised him. His father lingered. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. And it was true. Even when the door shut behind him and he was alone again, because Ricky had faced worse. This time last year, he was a stranger in an unfamiliar town. He didn't have any friends then. All he'd had was the lingering heartbreak of a failed relationship in another city, another state. Tomorrow would be different. His new friends would welcome him home, and then, well, he would find out one way or another 
and take it from there. But before he went inside, he closed his eyes and imagined a leather jacket creaking next to him, the faint smell of marijuana, and a deep, rumbling voice that always sent goosebumps racing across his skin. I love you, Ricky. September 1st, 1993. Anthony placed his palms on the bathroom counter and leaned over the sink, bringing his face closer to the mirror. The powder and base had been expertly applied, in his amateur opinion, every blemish and imperfection hidden beneath a subtle mask that moved with his face. He absolutely loved it. His green eyes considered themselves briefly, the temptation to add liner ever present, but he was too worried about blinding himself with the pencil. He'd have to ask Sylvia to teach him. For now, his attention darted down to his lips, which felt naked. That was easy enough to fix. Anthony opened a drawer, reaching toward the very back, where he wrapped his fingers around two small vials. One contained pink lip gloss that he sometimes applied in secrecy. The other was a tube of red lipstick he'd bought from a pharmacy. It's a gift, he had explained to a disinterested cashier. For someone else, he'd added, deepening his own embarrassment which had felt so out of sync with all the progress he'd made. Anthony was gay and proud of it. That's why he had decided to debut his new look on this, the first day of school. He didn't want anyone to think that he'd been shamed back into the closet, especially homophobic dickwads like Graham Fowler. Anthony would show them, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that he was defiantly queer. So why hadn't he put on the lipstick before, even in privacy? He took off the lid and twisted the bottom, a crimson slope rising up to meet him, as if eager for a kiss. Then he checked the mirror again. The pink dye in Anthony's hair was only present at the very tips. The rest was blonde, since Cameron had always wanted to see it that way. Which wasn't a big deal, but if they weren't dating, Anthony would have asked his mother to color it for him. He turned to the full-length mirror on the back of the bathroom door and smoothed down the three layers of loose-fitting shirts he wore. White was closest to his skin, and then pink, like flesh and bone. The outermost shirt was black, matching his tight-fitting jeans. If he blurred his vision, the oversized shirts looked more like a short dress that obscured his figure, his legs wrapped in dark leggings. Solid red vans on his feet completed the look, Although, not really, because he had planned for the lipstick to bring it all together. Then again, maybe he was already pushing his luck. Anthony tossed the makeup into the drawer and slammed it shut, returning to his bedroom to collect his things. He noticed the poster of The Cure's lead singer that was taped to his closet door. The calm, unwavering expression held a hint of judgment. Possibly because of the bright red lipstick that Robert Smith always wore. Anthony could practically hear the man chastising him in a thick British accent. There's nothing to be afraid of, love. It's just a wee bit of color. Exactly, Anthony replied. It doesn't have to mean anything. I mean, you're straight. So are most glam rockers. Nobody accuses the guys in Poison of being gay, and they are slathered in makeup. Robert Smith simply stared in response. Anthony felt foolish, and not because he was talking to a poster. He wasn't worried that anyone would think he was gay. That was exactly the point, wasn't it? Everyone knew already. So what did he have to lose? Cameron. Anthony frowned while stuffing his backpack with school supplies. He loved having a boyfriend. But it was limiting in certain ways. Like having to worry if the other person found you attractive. Then again, the powder and base had been received well. Anthony had first worn it on one of their dates, and without being prompted, Cameron had told him how nice he looked. A smidge of color wouldn't make much difference. His eyes darted over to Robert Smith again, whose lips were like a splatter of blood on white porcelain. Maybe it was better to ease into such things. Anthony returned to the bathroom, ripped open the drawer, and grabbed the pink lip gloss. He felt the same sensation he always did when putting it on, like he was stepping into cozy slippers after being on his feet all day. 
Speaking of which, he went to his bedroom and traded the red vans for a pair of pink Chuck Taylors. There, the look was complete. He felt great. Now he just needed to hold on to that confidence while everyone around him reacted, starting with his family. His parents, both working late shifts this week, were lounging around the breakfast table. His older brother, Mike, had moved out last month. Anthony was the last bird in the nest, which meant that he had his mom and dad's full attention. Don't you look nice, Dawn said, her eyes sparkling at him. Is that lip gloss, hun? Yeah, he replied, his attention darting over to his father. I don't get it, Joe said. I thought gay guys dressed like bikers. Shouldn't you be trying to grow a handlebar mustache? Anthony laughed. I think that was back in the 70s or something. So this is what? Joe pressed. Some sort of punk rock thing? Yes, Anthony leapt on the explanation. He loved it, especially since he was so into music. That's right, I've gone punk. Stick it to the man, Joe said, raising a fist in solidarity. Anthony laughed, never expecting to hear those words from someone who worked for the fire department. You are the man, he said when hugging his father. Joe blinked. That's a good thing, right? Drink your coffee, Dawn said to her husband before receiving a hug of her own. Have a nice first day, darling. Thanks, Mom. Anthony noticed the time and hurried out the front door to his car. No more walking to school for him, or riding the bus on rainy days. He'd moved up in the world, even though he always had to beg other people for gas money. Who wanted to work during the summer? Basically everyone he knew, it would seem, aside from Ricky, who'd been in exile. Anthony was eager to see him again. But first, as if to undermine just how punk rock he actually was... He turned the ignition and an upbeat pop song began playing. Culture Club, to be specific. Anthony had been thrilled to find the album in a cardboard box of eight-track tapes at the record store, where Sylvia worked, each marked down to 50 cents. Not that it helped clear the unwanted inventory. Eight tracks had fallen out of popularity in the early 80s. But, hey, that was the joy of owning an older car. Anthony felt his nerves dissipate as Boy George serenaded him, mostly because of the famous singer's appearance, which unapologetically blurred the line between genders. Anthony had become obsessed with him over the summer, and inspired. Oh God, was he really going to do this? He checked his appearance in the rearview mirror and all doubt fell away. If there were consequences, so be it, because this felt right. At least until he pulled up to his best friend's house, turned down the music, and honked. Omar came running out a few seconds later. If he had changed over the summer, it was difficult to tell. His black hair still flopped over one side of his forehead and covered all but his earlobes before cascading down the back of his neck. His dark eyes glimmered over a relentless smile as he dived into the passenger seat and tossed his backpack and skateboard in the rear. We're officially juniors, dude! Omar crowed before doing a double-take. Whoa, you look so hot! You really think so? Anthony asked, not hiding his insecurity. Hell yeah! Omar's attention lingered on the lip gloss before his grin widened. You're making me feel kind of gay! Anthony laughed. I love you, he said warmly. I love you too! Omar replied easily as they pulled out into the street. Are you freaking excited or what? This year is going to be huge for us. In what way? Anthony asked. Uh, let's see. Prom is gonna happen. You've got a boyfriend, and I've got a girlfriend. So even if we somehow manage to not have sex before then, it's basically guaranteed that we'll do it after the dance. Those are the rules. <laughs> I mean, even if I'm not in the mood... I'll suck it up and do my sacred duty. And don't try to sidetrack me with stories about all the sex you've been having with Cameron. You know exactly what I mean. He repeatedly inserted a finger into his fist, just in case there was any doubt. We'll see, Anthony said. 
Right now, prom seems very far away. Nobody says we have to wait. He felt a jolt of concern. Are you and Whitney talking about... Porking? Omar finished for him. Nah, she's hard to figure out. Whitney is like, I don't know, a free spirit or something. Anthony felt relief, even though it shouldn't matter to him either way. On paper, he wanted Omar to get laid. His best friend was hot. Someone should be riding him like a bronco. But the possibility of that actually happening made him uneasy. Maybe because he preferred it when Omar had been dating Sylvia? She was secretive about her feelings, but Anthony was certain that she still loved him. His best friend's first time should be with someone like her. The dude is crazy about you, Omar said, drawing him back to the present. Why else would he be waiting outside? The car slowed just as Anthony's pulse quickened. He pulled into his boyfriend's driveway and parked as Cameron ambled over. His skin was still bronze from three glorious months of sunshine. Cameron was a little broader and taller than when they'd first met, nicely filling out the blue polo shirt he wore. His tussled brown hair swept across his forehead, touching his left eyebrow, the rest neatly trimmed. He smiled when locking eyes with Anthony through the windshield. Oh, yeah, Omar said while watching him approach. You guys are totally gonna do it soon. Get in the back, Anthony said while fighting down a smile. All right. Omar started climbing over the seats. You could get out first, Anthony chastised, but he was laughing when Cameron opened the door. With a final push on Omar's shoes, he cleared the space between them. Hey, Cameron said with a dopey grin as he slid close. Hi, Anthony replied shyly. Cameron's blue eyes had him pinned as he leaned close for a kiss, but before that could happen, he backed off suddenly. Wait, are you wearing lipstick? Lip gloss, Anthony tried to sound confident. What do you think? It's different, Cameron replied. Different good or different bad? He didn't have a chance to ask because Cameron was leaning toward him again. Just like before, he changed his mind at the last second. Will it get on my lips? Omar laughed from the back seat. What? Cameron asked, glaring at him. I've never kissed a girl before. I have, Omar said gleefully. As in multiple girls. We know, Anthony said with an eye roll that he hoped disguised his discomfort. Was the base and powder enough to hide the blood rushing to his face? So, will it? Cameron asked, his attention still on the back seat. If it doesn't stop me, dude, Omar replied, then it shouldn't stop you. Cameron shrugged and finally kissed Anthony, thank goodness. Although he noticed when reversing out of the driveway, the way his boyfriend discreetly wiped his mouth on the back of his hand. No big deal, all part of the experience. Anthony was just as eager to check his own lips to see if they were still glossy enough. Hey, he said, addressing the rearview mirror. Speaking of your girlfriend, do we need to pick her up? Nope. Whitney likes to walk, so she can commune with the trees along the way. I'm telling you, free spirit. I think you make a nice couple, Cameron said in approving tones. Anthony remembered how relieved he'd seemed when learning that Omar was dating someone new, which was understandable, but there was nothing to worry about. Anthony loved Cameron. Nobody could compete with that. Especially a straight guy who could never love him back. Not in the same way, at least. Anthony turned the music back up and laughed when the others groaned. They were sick to death of hearing the same songs, but there weren't many options, and Color by Numbers was a great album. It's a miracle, Omar said as they reached the school, intentionally referencing one of the song titles, that I haven't lost my mind yet. Are there seriously no metal 8-track tapes? I'll dig around the next time I'm at the record store, Anthony promised as they got out. It'll suck not starting each day in journalism class together, Omar said, pulling out his camcorder to shoot footage of the school. That was indeed a bummer. Having completed the course, their choices were to write for the newspaper or work on the yearbook, 
which were separate classes. They each felt strongly about which path they wanted to take, even though it wasn't the same one. So they made a tough decision. At least we've got lunch to look forward to, Anthony replied. Yeah, Omar perked up, but not because of the reminder. He'd spotted someone. There she is! I'll see you guys later. He dropped his board to the ground and skated away. Alone at last, Cameron said before coming in for another kiss. His features were concerned when he pulled away. I, uh, better walk you to your first class. Anthony shrugged. Okay, are you worried about something? Yeah, Cameron admitted as they slowly made their way across the parking lot. What about Graham and... He looked Anthony over. Everyone else. Oh, that, he said casually. They might call me names again and paint another bad word on my locker, but somehow I think I'll survive. Cameron didn't seem reassured. Who cares what small-minded people say or do, Anthony told him, his attention flicking in the direction Omar had disappeared in. All that matters to me is what you guys think. Do you want my opinion? Cameron asked, taking his hand to stop him. Anthony swallowed and nodded. Yeah, as long as it's the truth. I think you're beautiful. Cameron kissed him. He didn't stop, either. Not for a long time, which made Anthony glad that he decided to bring the lip gloss with him, just in case it needed to be reapplied. If this kept up, he'd be burning through multiple tubes a week. Chapter 2 September 1st, 1993 Cameron leaned against the doorframe of Anthony's first class while watching him get settled. His boyfriend noticed, seeming to get more and more embarrassed each time he checked and saw him still standing there. Cameron supposed he was behaving like a parent who had just dropped off their child at school, but he just loved Anthony so much, and he finally turned away, letting a grimace appear on his face. He was worried. Last year had been bad enough. Anthony tended to play down the name-calling, and he never brought up how Graham had punched him in the face, or the way he'd been ganged up on and knocked to the floor before Diego came to his rescue. Each of those attacks had happened here, inside the school, where they were supposed to be safe, but obviously weren't. And now he'd shown up on the first day of junior year wearing makeup. What did Anthony think was going to happen? Cameron wasn't sure how to protect him from the inevitable backlash. He tried to kiss off all the lip gloss before they entered the building, hoping that would help. Cameron wiped his mouth and saw a shimmer of pink on his hand. Anthony was going to get pulverized, but not if Cameron could help it. He would walk him to each class if need be. He was already jogging to make it to his own on time, the hallways slowly clearing. He pulled his schedule out of his back pocket and checked it again before reorienting and going down another hall. Finding the right door was easy because someone was standing outside of it while glancing around. Ricky. Except the shrimpy little guy he'd been expecting had been replaced by someone much lankier with a shock of black hair that was parted on one side. He looked older and handsome. Cameron, Ricky cried. A blur closed the distance and slammed into him. Cameron laughed in surprise and wrapped his arms around a body that was definitely taller. Ricky was holding on to him for dear life and didn't seem intent on letting go. Cameron closed his eyes, imagining a messy mop of hair and permanently askew glasses. There was still a hint of that boy when they finally let go of each other, but he was quickly being replaced by a man with refined style. The glasses were new, the frames subtle and the lenses thinner, allowing sensitive dark eyes to stand out clearly as they moved over Cameron's body. Wow, Ricky said, pushing the glasses up on his nose. You look great. Have you checked the mirror lately? Cameron asked. You're like a different person. How many years were you gone? Ten? Twenty? That's how it felt, Ricky croaked. I miss you guys. We missed you too. Why were they talking in plurals? 
maybe because it was less awkward than saying outright how they felt. Which was silly, because Cameron wasn't shy about such things. Me especially, he said. I missed you the most. Ricky smiled at this, but it was subdued. That's probably true. Oh, crap. I'm sure Diego missed you the mostest. I don't know, Ricky said. I still haven't heard from him. You just got in last night, right? Ricky nodded when leading the way into the classroom. I tried paging him, but he never called me back. Do you know if his number changed or something? I don't, sorry. Cameron glanced around. The walls were lined with desks, a computer set up at each. Tables that sat two were in traditional rows in the middle of the room, but this was clearly going to be a different experience than they were used to. Hey, this looks neat. Yeah, Ricky said. I was worried they'd have those horrible old computers we used in grade school and junior high. You know, the ones with the orange screens. Ours are green. Cameron said with a laugh. But yeah, whenever I tell people how fun computers are, you can tell they're thinking of those. So, what do we have here? Brand new 486s. No kidding, Cameron asked. Are they multimedia? I wish, but they are running Windows. Have you ever used that? He shook his head. Only when messing around with display models at stores... This is exciting. They grinned at each other. Cameron earned enough money to pay for the long-distance calls, so over the summer they had managed to stay in touch. As the school year neared, he had read the course catalog over the phone to Ricky so he could pick his electives. When realizing that a new class had been added, Computer Sciences, they had about lost their minds, since it was one of their mutual hobbies. What was next? A course that focused on eating cereal while watching Saturday morning cartoons? This is going to be amazing, Cameron breathed. Yeah, Ricky said. I hope we get to... Okay, everyone, an adult voice interrupted. The teacher at the front of the room was an older man with scraggly gray hair that ringed a bald dome. His glasses were so thick that it was a miracle his pointed nose wasn't bent from the weight. I'm sure we're all excited to get our hands on the new machines, but we won't always be working on them. Have a seat at the tables for now. Cameron and Ricky glanced at each other before racing toward the nearest so they could sit together. The teacher took attendance and provided an overview of what they'd be learning, which included programming. That would be an interesting challenge. The atmosphere became thick with impatience as the hour wore on. All right the teacher said, finally standing up at his desk. Each of you will be assigned a computer to work on. You'll use the same machine each day. Uh, there aren't enough for everyone, so a few of you will have to share. Do I have any volunteers? Cameron's hand shot up at the same time that Ricky's did. The teacher nodded in approval. He walked them over to the computer they would be using and left them there so he could get the rest of the class set up. I wonder if they have any games installed, Ricky said, clicking the mouse while peering at the screen. If they do, it'll be the Oregon Trail, Cameron replied. Ricky laughed. <laughs> that or where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Cameron grabbed the keyboard, since Ricky had opened up a word processing application, and typed, She's pooping in a bathroom stall. Ricky laughed like it was the funniest joke in the world the joyous sound making it impossible not to smile. His Adam's apple bobbed up and down in a neck that looked a little thicker and stronger. What? he asked self-consciously when raising his glasses to wipe at his eyes. Cameron realized that he'd been staring. Nothing, he said quickly. It's just amazing how much you've changed. I don't feel any different, Ricky said with a shrug. Really? You didn't wake up one morning and hit your head on the ceiling? Ricky laughed again. I haven't gotten that much taller. You're still bigger than me. His eyes moved to the curve of Cameron's bicep. Okay, everyone, the teacher said. Let's start with some basics. 
They listened dutifully to the lecture and followed the instructions, but it wasn't anything they didn't already know, even with their limited experience using a graphical user interface. Cameron noticed Ricky's knee begin to bounce. It only stopped when he grabbed the keyboard. Can I ask you something? Ricky typed into the word processor. After watching him nod, he added, Did something bad happen to Diego? Cameron hesitated before reaching for the keyboard. Mindy said he looked a little rough the first few times she saw him. That's all it took to make Ricky's chin tremble, so he hastily typed, But he seemed fine by the time he got out. Ricky swallowed and reached for the keyboard again. Are you guys holding back? Did he say anything about hating me or never wanting to see me again? Cameron didn't make him wait. He started shaking his head while typing his response. She never got to talk to Diego. It wasn't possible, but... Ricky cut him off by minimizing the window, which confused Cameron until he heard the teacher's voice behind them. You need to double-click the icon in the bottom left of the desktop to open the correct program, he instructed. Ricky complied. They fell in line for the rest of class. Cameron couldn't help noticing how the same troubled expression kept returning to Ricky's face. It was still there when the bell finally rang. They stood and gathered up their things. Diego's going to be happy to see you, Cameron told him. Maybe, Ricky sighed and shook his head. Who knows? I do. You look amazing. And you're you. He laughed when Ricky scrunched up his face at this. Trust me, Diego might do his grumpy, I don't need anyone act, but I don't envy his chances, because you're the most lovable guy I've ever met. Ricky looked like he was on the verge of tears again, but then he smiled and slammed into him for another hug. Cameron wrapped his arms around him, wishing more than ever that he could keep the people he cared most about safe from harm. September 1st, 1993. Omar couldn't stop smiling. Junior year was off to a great start. He'd made sure to choose electives that should each be an easy A, and had also hit the jackpot with his assigned lunch break. He'd be eating with both his best friend and his girlfriend each day. And, um, also his ex. Omar looked across the table where Sylvia and Anthony were sharing the contents of their sack lunches. He would have been over the moon to have seen that last year. And while he was happy about it now, it was a little awkward. He hadn't seen much of Sylvia recently. For the past month or so, they'd mostly kept in touch through Anthony. Omar felt bad about that, because they'd promised to stay friends and to maybe try again. But... Then Whitney had happened. He glanced around for her, unsure where she'd gotten to, and noticed someone else. Hey, look who it is, he said when getting to his feet. My man Ricky. Anthony stood up too. Pretty soon they were on either side of him, ruffling Ricky's hair and patting him on the back. The poor guy nearly dropped his tray. Omar looped an arm around his neck and guided him to the table. It's good to have you back, Anthony said warmly. Even though you are a lowly sophomore, Omar teased. What? Ricky cried. I thought only being a freshman was bad. You guys acted like sophomores were cool. That was last year, Omar said dismissively. What did we know? We were immature sophomores. It's baked into the name and everything. You're thinking of sophomoric, Anthony corrected. But it's true. We're much more mature, so you should always do what we say. Ricky rolled his eyes and laughed. I'm not sure why I missed you guys. They all settled down at the table, Ricky attempting to sit on Omar's right. Sorry, my dude, he said, but that seat is reserved for my girlfriend. Ricky looked to Sylvia in confusion before remembering everything that he'd heard about while away. She didn't blush or squirm. Sylvia was too damn cool for that sort of thing. She patted the empty space on the far side of her. You're welcome to sit next to me. Anthony shook his head and scooted down the bench toward her to make room. I need my little brother close to me. Get over here. 
Ricky grinned and took a seat next to him. He nodded across the table. Hi, David. Hey, came the muted response. Ricky began glancing around. Omar could guess why, so he started shaking his head in warning, not that it helped. Where's Dave? Omar grimaced at the same time that Anthony did. Like them, Dave and David had always been a package deal, best friends who were inseparable. Except quite a few things had changed over the summer. He's a traitor, David mumbled. A what? Ricky asked in confusion. A traitor, Omar repeated for his friend. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Ricky's brow furrowed in confusion until he saw what they'd already witnessed. Graham Fowler, sitting with a bunch of his stupid cronies. Dave, right there in the middle of them. Ricky was aghast. Why would he sit with those jerks? David merely shrugged. He wasn't happy with this turn of events. Well, you're still cool, Ricky said to him, picking up on the dour mood. I really like your mustache. David stroked it with a finger, summoning a smile. Thanks. It finally got thick. I've been trying since junior high. Hey, I like your new glasses. Omar narrowed his eyes. Wait a minute. They are new. Ricky shrugged and quickly occupied himself with his food. Where did you get them? Omar demanded. I know you just flew into town last night, so unless you ordered them before you left and picked them up this morning... Ricky wore a guilty expression. My old ones broke when I was out of town. That's no excuse, Omar chastised. You should have called my parents' store and given them your prescription. They could have mailed you a new pair. Anthony snorted. They're a different style. How would he have tried them on? Omar turned on his best friend. Oh, you're taking his side? Don't come crying to me the next time you stay the night and there's nothing to eat. My dad already gives me guilt trips for not having many friends who wear glasses. He turned his accusation on Ricky. I know you do this to me. You could always get a pair, Sylvia said casually. Instead of wearing contacts? You wear contacts? David asked in surprise. I didn't realize. Because he doesn't want anyone to, Anthony said, adding in a stage whisper. It's a secret. Not anymore, Omar said with a sigh. That's what I get for letting a beautiful woman stare into my eyes. The words had slipped out of their own accord, as they so often did. His gaze met Sylvia's before they both hurriedly looked away again. Ricky was staring at the empty space next to Omar, his expression confused. Is Whitney absent today? No, she's somewhere, Omar said, glancing around. She's sort of a... Don't say it, Anthony interjected. Free spirit, Omar continued. Like a soaring eagle. That had become something of a running joke between them. Most of his time with Whitney was spent laughing. They had a lot of fun together. Where the hell was she, anyway? Has anyone seen Diego today? Ricky asked casually. Everyone shook their heads, except for Sylvia. I had a class with him this morning. He's here? Ricky asked in excitement. I was starting to think that he skipped. Did he ask about me? No, Sylvia said. Anthony nudged her discreetly. Although he did seem to be looking for someone, she added, before seeming to struggle within herself. But I don't know if it was you. Sylvia, Anthony hissed. What? She shot back. I don't want him to think I'm a liar. I prefer the truth, Ricky assured her. As you know. What could have been a tense moment ended in laughter. They no longer seemed to hold a grudge against each other, even though she had once blackmailed Ricky into staying silent about the time she'd kissed Keisha while still dating him. That had been the wedge which finally drove them apart, Omar had broken up with her, and she had broken up with him on a previous occasion, so it obviously wasn't meant to be. Too bad. Sylvia was such a cool chick. Her eyes met his again, but he didn't feel the need to look away this time. Omar offered a sympathetic smile that she returned. He hoped that she, like him, 
mostly thought about how good it had been. Scree! He started laughing as a thin blonde girl came running over with her arms spread wide. Whitney circled the table in this manner before finally plopping down next to him. The eagle has landed, she declared. What's going on, everyone? Her long hair had been trimmed to shoulder length, hints of her ears sticking out at the sides. Omar loved running his finger through those wavy locks to reveal them fully. Was it weird to be attracted to someone's ears? If so, it wouldn't bother her, because Whitney was weird to the core, in a good way. Hey, girl, she said, waving at Sylvia happily. Thanks again for your help. No problem, Sylvia said without a shred of animosity, which kind of bugged him. Would it kill her to be a little jealous? I'm still singing it, Whitney said before doing karate chop motions in the air. S S S A A A F F F E E E. Omar shook his head in confusion. What are you talking about? T T T T. Sylvia replied. Why 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 why? Safety dance. Anthony said with a grin. Omar rolled his eyes. I should have known. Music is your secret language. Whitney came into the store the other day. Sylvia explained. Whitney nodded enthusiastically. I had to hear it again. About five times in a row, in fact, Sylvia said with good humor. She nudged Anthony. Who's the artist? Oh, I've got this one. Um, Anthony's brow crinkled in concentration before it stretched thin again. Men without hats. Anyway, Omar said as they high-fived each other. I saved some fries for you, babe. Thank God, Whitney said. I am starving. She dove in with both hands, happily humming under her breath while chewing and bobbing her head left and right. She was so adorable. Omar could spend all day just... Jessica! Whitney cried suddenly. Oh my God, I haven't seen you in ages! Within seconds, she had leapt to her feet and run off again, clusters of fries still gripped in each hand. Is she coming back? Anthony asked. Then he held up a palm to ward off his response. Never mind, I know what you're going to say. I miss you guys so much, Ricky said with a grin. Hey, did I tell you that I went to Disneyland? They caught up for the remainder of lunch break, Omar eating the rest of the fries he'd been saving for Whitney. When the bell rang, he stood and held out his tray when he noticed Sylvia gathering her trash so he could place it on top. He always did the same thing for Anthony. Thanks, she said, and to his surprise followed him to the trash cans. I appreciate you being so nice to Whitney, he told her. I was kind of worried about how that would go. She's cool, Sylvia said. You should have seen her dancing around the store. You would have filmed it for sure. Nah, he said, his throat feeling raw. There can only be one record store girl. She smiled at the reference to a film he'd made of her and had watched countless times since, including recently because it still occupied a special place in his heart. You make a nice couple, Sylvia said. I'm happy for you. So, if that's why you've been avoiding me... No, he said before he could stop himself. And yet, he also couldn't tell her the real reason why, so he shuffled his feet while the tension seemed to increase between them. Sylvia was the first to look away, her eyebrows raising. I'm going to say hi to Mindy she said. I'll see you around. Yeah, Omar said, watching her go with an ache of nostalgia. See ya. Chapter 3. September 1st, 1993. Mindy had her left knee on the cafeteria table and her right foot on the bench so she could see over the swarm of incoming students. Lunch was always the most stressful part of the first day, everyone scrambling to figure out where to sit and with whom. There were two separate lunch breaks and no method to ensure you'd end up sharing yours with a friend. Oh, sure, everyone had their theories. Taking the same electives or submitting your enrollment papers simultaneously were the most popular, but she'd tried all of that and learned that it was mostly a crapshoot. 
Keisha, she said, waving a hand in excitement. A lithe black girl with a crew cut turned in a slow circle until spotting her. Then she sauntered over with a lopsided smile. It's good to be wanted, Keisha said, setting her things on the table. Who can we expect to join us for this little soiree? A certain mutual friend of ours? I wish, and so does she, Mindy said, crinkling her nose. Sylvia got stuck in the same lunch break with Omar. I saw her on my way in. Oh, the irony, Keisha drawled. And so soon after the divorce, Mindy giggled. Hopefully they can get along like my parents do. See anyone else we know? Keisha asked in tones that were a little too casual. She seemed to be searching for someone in particular. Yuck, Mindy quickly lowered herself. Troy Mitchell, the pushy jerk who had been her first kiss, had just walked into the cafeteria with the Song Sisters flanking him. Unfortunately, I do. Keisha followed her gaze, one of her fine eyebrows arching as a smile played about her lips. Mindy stared, her attention divided between her friend and some of her worst enemies. Oh my gosh, she gasped. Which one of them is it? I don't have the faintest idea what you mean. Keisha said dismissively. The liar. Keisha had come out to her earlier in the year, and despite trusting her with that bombshell, refused to spill the beans on who she had the hots for, aside from Sylvia, of course. You know who my heart belongs to, Keisha said without prompting. I'm not sure that I do, Mindy said, intending to peer suspiciously at the Song Sisters, but she became distracted when noticing someone familiar. Cameron! She squealed with glee. He grinned and hustled over, giving her a hug and then Keisha, too. He was the sweetest. Mindy had really bonded with him over the summer. She'd never had a close guy friend before, but she absolutely adored him. Are we going to eat outside like we planned? He asked. Yeah. Mindy surveyed the cafeteria and experienced a pang of disappointment when she failed to spot someone tall and brooding. I guess it'll be just us. Let's go. Beyond the windows of the cafeteria was a walled-in courtyard, where she and Sylvia had often eaten in earlier years. Mindy led her friends to a corner where Ivy climbed the brick, giving it the appearance of a fairy tale setting. "'Have you seen Ricky yet?' Cameron asked. "'Because I have.' "'No!' Mindy exclaimed. They had talked about him so much during the summer that he felt like a beloved character from a TV show. On occasion they had called him together, too. Mindy hadn't known Ricky all that well before the break, but was eager to see him again. How's he doing? He got hot, Cameron said with a guffaw. Really? Keisha asked. The little guy, who was always following Diego around? Yep, Cameron confirmed. He's still cute, but with an edge of hotness, if that makes sense. Nothing about love does, Keisha replied. And that's just the way I like it. Oh, yeah? Mindy pried as they settled down on the concrete, sitting cross-legged and unpacking their lunches while facing each other. How would you know? I've had my share of experiences, Keisha answered. Any of them recent? Mindy pressed. Keisha's eyes flicked to Cameron and back again. He already knows, Mindy admitted. I told him during the summer. Keisha's jaw dropped. You outed me? He's gay! Mindy said, gesturing at him like a showroom prize. You're from the same tribe. Keisha thought about it and shrugged. As long as it stays between us. I told Anthony, Cameron said sheepishly. He's my boyfriend. I had to. Keisha sighed. And he no doubt told Omar, who probably told everyone else. Omar can keep a secret, Mindy said. She didn't defend him often, but he'd behaved like a gentleman in the aftermath of his split with Sylvia. And, um, he already knew. Remember? That's why they broke up. Anthony already knew when I told him, Cameron confessed. Wonderful, Keisha said with a wince. Apparently it was the kiss heard around the world. And now it's ancient history, Mindy said, nibbling on a sandwich. So, who's lucky bachelor at number two? Oh, no, Keisha said, shaking her head. If anything, you've both just reminded me of the importance of discretion. Fine, 
Mindy said, intentionally sounding clipped. We can do this the hard way. Just be aware that I always catch my man. Or in this case, my woman. Your woman. You might as well tell her now, Cameron said. When it comes to gay people, Mindy is like a bloodhound. It's true, she said proudly. I don't even have to try. They just flock to me. The others laughed and continued joking around. They didn't have much catching up to do, since they'd seen each other during the summer, and would again later today in theater class, although she was disappointed that Cameron wouldn't be joining them this year. What are we going to do without your amazing sets? She complained when the topic came up. Sorry, Cameron said. Anthony wanted us to have a class together, so he talked me into taking the same creative writing elective as him. Boo, Mindy said with a pout. Don't you see enough of each other already? Not really, he said with a dopey grin. What about the plays themselves? Keisha asked. Would you still be willing to work on those after school? I don't have time. I got a job restoring furniture. Hey, speaking of which, how old is the farm that you live on? Because my boss says those are a great source of furniture and antiques. Mindy checked the elegant gold watch she'd gotten as a gift from her father on her 16th birthday. She had to look at it twice, because she forgot to take note of the time when admiring the fine details. They only had about ten more minutes before classes resumed. I'll catch up with you guys later, she said while standing. I have to, um, take care of something. They were already in deep conversation, thank goodness, or they might have noticed her blush. She had nothing to be ashamed of. Mindy simply felt a responsibility for Diego, as she had all summer. That wasn't her idea. Ricky had asked her to stay in touch with him, and she'd managed to, even though it meant jumping through a few hoops. The youth detention center where he'd been locked up only allowed immediate family to visit. So, she'd volunteered. Nothing about it had been easy. Mindy read to a room full of unruly boys for half an hour at a time, often suffering verbal abuse, but only at first. Diego took care of that. Her stomach lurched at the memory, because it was sweet, in a way, but also painful to witness. The first time she'd seen Diego, he'd had a nasty black eye. He was even more beat up the next visit, but so were the guys who had given her the most lip. They'd kept their swollen mouths shut after that. Thankfully, as the summer went on, such incidents became less common. Diego had almost looked like his old self by the time she finished the book. Mindy still remembered looking up from the pages to find, without fail, his smoldering eyes locked onto hers, never wavering. She had wanted so badly to talk to him, to treat his wounds and take him somewhere safe where he couldn't be hurt anymore. Mindy reached the doors that butterflied out to the parking lot. Diego used to eat alone out there. She left the building and searched for his car, struggling to remember what it looked like. Mindy had only seen it briefly when taking refuge inside it on a cold night when she'd fled from the worst, and only, date of her life. Although she had seen it again some months later, when he'd shown her a trunk full of toilet paper, which had seemed so funny at the time, but it was the same night he set fire to Graham Fowler's house, even if it had been an accident, of sorts. The breath caught in her throat. There he was. Diego was leaning against the side of his car, his massive arms crossed over his chest. He was wearing a black sleeveless t-shirt and a pair of tight blue jeans, which suited him so much more than the horrible orange prison uniforms. He looked like his old self again, especially when he noticed her, pushed away from the car and walked over wearing a subtle smirk. Hey, princess, he said, running his hand through his swept back hair. Hi, she said almost overwhelmed to be speaking to him again. Mindy had wanted to say so much over the summer, but now she found herself at a loss for words, so she hugged him instead. Diego raised his arms to his sides and didn't lower them again until she let go, but that was all right. She felt the beating of his heart against her ear, which was reassuring. At least he was free now and would be okay. How have you been? Diego asked after she stepped away and collected herself. I hope you did something more fun this summer than reading to my dumbass. You aren't dumb, she said. But yes, that was a terrible place. Are you okay? Diego shrugged. 
Wasn't my first time there, and probably won't be my last. I'm all right. But he hadn't been. She knew that from the note he had given her, the one she had carried with her like a talisman ever since, so she wouldn't forget how important it was to keep going back to that wretched place week after week. Forget about all that, he said, reading her face. Tell me something fun you did. I got my lifeguard certification, she said proudly. And I used it. I actually got paid for sitting around a swimming pool all day. Can you believe that? Sounds like a good deal, Diego replied. Of course, someday you'll have to give mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to a guy who tastes like a triple cheeseburger. That's when you really earn your paycheck. Mindy giggled. I did have to dive in to help a little girl who got the wind knocked out of her. She jumped off the high dive and hit the water face first. It was painful to watch, but gratifying to use the skills I'd learned. Awesome, Diego said with an upward nod. That's really cool. She wanted to reach up and touch his thick lips where they had been bloody and split, just to make sure that he was truly healed. Instead, her cheeks flushed. He must have noticed, because a dimple appeared in his cheek when he smirked again. What else did you get up to? he asked. I went horseback riding with Keisha out on her farm. Do you know Sylvia? We all had a slumber party together. It was really fun. Oh, and I hung out with Cameron a lot. We stayed in touch with Ricky. Have you seen him yet? No. Diego's eyes moved to the horizon and remained there. Not yet. Oh. Me neither. I'm sure he'll be thrilled. The bell rang, sounding distant. Diego's eyes sought out hers again. He tilted his head toward his car. Want to get out of here? You mean skip? She cried, already scandalized. No way! He laughed. You've got it at least once. It's part of the experience. But not today, she said, gently swatting his arm as an excuse to touch him. So, um, what was it like, if you don't mind me asking? He didn't need her to elaborate. Diego was quiet as they walked toward the school. Like being in a war, he said. Except you're not sure if anyone is on the same side as you. She wished she could take his hand. It wouldn't have to mean anything. Mindy simply wanted to give him the comfort that he'd been deprived of. And some other stuff happened, he added. Like what? she asked. I don't know. He reached past her to open the door. I'm still trying to figure everything out. When would they have a chance to talk about it? Would it be weird to invite him over to her house? They'd had so much fun there when she'd helped him rehearse lines for the play, after he'd been suspended. Are you going to audition again this year? she asked. He shrugged his massive shoulders. I don't know. Are you taking the theater elective? Yes, she said. I'll still be doing wardrobe. Or maybe you'll end up on stage again, he said with a sly smile. She never would have made it up there without his encouragement, or repeated the experience on a smaller scale over and over in front of leering boys if he hadn't needed her so much. She thought of the note again. Hey, Diego said, his hand brushing against Mindy's to get her attention. She stopped and looked up at him. Thanks. For everything. I wish I could have done more, she said. It's so mean that they wouldn't let you see any of your friends. Didn't bother me, Diego replied. I don't have any. That's not true, she said. I'm your friend, aren't I? Yeah, he admitted. I guess you are. So there you go. And speaking of which, stop eating lunch outside all by yourself. Come sit with me and the others. He raised a critical eyebrow at the suggestion. Who are we talking about exactly? Keisha, Mindy said. You know her, don't you? Yeah, she's cool. Cameron has the same lunch break, too. Huxley? Diego said, sounding slightly more optimistic. He's all right. The first eyebrow joined the other in a scowl. What about his boyfriend? Nope, Mindy said. That's it. Just the three of us. 
but it could be four. Will you sit with us tomorrow, please? Diego looked to the ceiling and groaned, but when his eyes returned to hers, they were sparkling. Maybe. Really? No promises. Well, if you do, we sit outside in the courtyard. It's not so different from the parking lot, really. Don't make me bring my friends to you, because I will. Diego chuckled. I'll see you around. Okay, Mandy said, wanting to hug him again. Um, she glanced around and pointed. My locker is that way. Don't let me stop you, Diego replied. She hurried down the hall, looking over her shoulder once. He was still watching her. When she reached her locker, Mindy unzipped her backpack so she could switch to the books she would need. That's when she noticed the folded note. Diego had dropped it at the end of one of her reading sessions as the boys filed out of the room under the watchful gaze of a guard. He had done so casually, making it seem like an accident, until his eyes flicked to hers and away again. She told the guard it was hers when she picked it up and had waited until she was sitting in her car before unfolding and reading the note. Mindy had expected it to be a message for Ricky. Instead, in messy handwriting, it said, You're the only thing keeping me sane. Thanks, princess. From that point on, she never struggled with motivation to show up and read to the inmates. Or, if she was honest, to one person in particular, because she wasn't a saint. Mindy hadn't gone to that bleak place out of the goodness of her heart, but it was her heart that had led her there regardless, for other reasons. September 1st. Keisha bent over to touch the tips of her fingers to her toes. When she stood again, she swept her arms through the air with a flourish, to better stretch them, of course, and to impress anyone who might be looking. Although when she checked the entrance to the gym, Keisha still didn't see who she was waiting for. She remained attentive when continuing her routine, ignoring the excited chatter of the other students. Her vigilance was finally rewarded when someone with a mane of dark hair and an impressive chest rolled into the room, but sadly, he wasn't her type. Hey, Omar said, walking over to join her. This is cool. I've never been on the girl's side of the gym before. Probably because a partition ran between it and the boy's side, where she could already hear shoes squeaking on the floor. Actually, that's not true, Omar said placing his hands on his hips while surveying the scene with a satisfied grin. I filmed some cheerleaders in here last year. Keisha stopped working her neck from left to right and gave him her full attention. What are you doing here now? This is dance class, right? Yes. Is this for the video yearbook? Where's your camcorder? In my locker. Omar beamed at her. I'm here to bust some moves. Really? she asked, not hiding her surprise. Uh-huh. Omar was watching some freshmen attempt to pirouette. I'm pretty good, too, so I figured it would be easy. He looked at her while scratching the back of his head sheepishly. And, uh, I really need to up my grades. Cool, she said, deciding it wasn't so strange after all. Not after seeing someone like Diego Gomez shake his hips so skillfully during their production of West Side Story. Have you been in this class before? He asked. Nope. Maybe we should have done this sooner. Omar leaned in close to speak in conspiring tones. Looks like I'm the only guy, and you're a lesbian. So no matter who we end up dancing with, we're in for a good time. He nudged her. Am I right? Keisha nudged him back. Maybe. What exactly are you expecting from this class? Omar shrugged. Today, not much. We'll probably start with something easy, like slow dancing. I can already do a waltz and a tango. I can give you some pointers if you need them. Much appreciated, Keisha said, barely managing to keep her amusement in check. Did he really think everyone would be dancing in pairs like they were practicing for prom? Although she shouldn't judge, her own reason for being here was far from innocent. A pair of twins entered the gym. When one of them noticed her and perked up, Keisha's heart rolled gleefully down a hill covered in dewy green grass. Uh-oh, Omar said loudly to attract their attention. 
Here comes trouble. The Song sisters walked side by side toward them, making it easy to spot their differences. Both were lean and athletic, with fine features and dark straight hair. Faith's was longer, her expression ever critical. Hope wore her hair in a short bob. She had an air of perpetual patience that came from being around someone as domineering as her sister, because Faith could be a real pit bull. Are you going to film us again? she asked Omar. Nope, I'm here to dance. Hey, Hope said before biting her lower lip. Hey yourself, Keisha replied with a self-assured smirk that was all facade, because her insides were going wild. So are you gay now, too? Faith demanded. Keisha tore her attention away from Hope, relieved that the question wasn't directed at her. Huh? Omar said. No? What makes you think that? Because you're in a class that boys don't take, Faith said, continuing to grill him. And all your other friends are gay, aren't they? Not all of them, Omar spluttered. Who cares either way? Faith shrugged, her dark eyes considering Keisha briefly before she addressed Omar again. Are you still dating that girl? Nah, we broke up. Faith seemed to reconsider him. So you're single? Keisha noticed the way that Hope tensed up. Nope, I'm dating Whitney Brannigan Habersham. Isn't that a crazy name? Faith sighed as if disappointed, and not because she was interested. Faith was dating Troy, and for some reason it bothered her that Hope was still single. Faith looked around the room as if searching for other options before grunting. I hope this class is fun. It will be, Hope said, her gaze settling on Keisha briefly. I'm sure of it. The teacher entered the room, clapping her hands and gesturing for them all to come near. She had frizzy gray hair and was wiry like a yoga instructor. Welcome, everyone, she said. My name is Mrs. Fiscus. I see some familiar faces this year, and a few new ones, too. I'm sure you're eager to get started, but first, we'll need to go over some basics, starting with what you'll wear during this class. You'll want light, flexible clothing, all in black, please. That's exactly my style, Omar said from next to Keisha. Short-sleeved shirts, the teacher continued and tights or leggings for the pants. Wait, what? The teacher didn't hear him. Athletic shorts are fine during practice, but not when we have an official performance at a pep rally or during a special event like a football game. What's she talking about? Omar whispered. Keisha shrugged innocently, certain that he would transfer out before the end of the week. For today, I'd like to lead you through the stretching exercises that we'll begin each period with. If you were in this class previously, feel free to help the others with their form. One of the freshmen smiled at Omar. He turned a panicked expression on Keisha. What does she mean tights? And football games? Maybe she expects us to do the foxtrot during halftime, she replied drolly. Just remember that easy, eh? Right, right, Omar said. They spread out into rows. Hope tried to stand next to her, until Faith grabbed her hand and yanked her toward the front. That became sweet torture as they stretched and strained. Keisha normally prided herself on her synchronization, but her movements now were intentionally delayed, especially when Hope put her palms flat on the floor, her face appearing upside down between her spread legs. She smiled at Keisha, who bent over while laughing. They tended to have fun together, even though it was always fleeting. Keisha's summer had begun with a frustrating revival of a hopeless crush. Sylvia was finally single, which could have paved the way for them to explore their potential together, if she wasn't so hung up on Omar. Keisha had tried to convince herself that she was fine with being friends, but the feelings had swollen like a ship taking on water. Just when it seemed like she would sink to the ocean floor, she'd bumped into a lifeboat. Or more accurately, a group of teenage girls wearing slinky shorts and tight-fitting t-shirts. Keisha had been walking down Main Street when she ran into Hope and the group she played soccer with. They'd stopped to chat, the rest of the team hustling along the sidewalk like a burning fuse. Hope was clearly glad to see her, but just as obligated to catch up with her friends. That's when she'd thrown Keisha a lifeline. 
We play every Wednesday, Hope had said. That park over there? Keisha had asked, pointing at it until she saw a nod. That's funny. I like to read in that park, usually on Wednesdays. Maybe we'll see each other next time. Hope had bit her bottom lip, as she was prone to do, before nodding and racing off to catch up with her friends. And so it went. Keisha would show up early enough to wish her luck, watch her on the field while holding a book that she made little progress on, and they'd talk after or sometimes during the game, which never lasted long before prior commitments stole Hope away from her again. But she walked away from each encounter having learned something new. Hope wanted to be a coach, for instance, and was allergic to cats. She hated crying in front of other people despite loving sad movies. Each tidbit was a piece of a jigsaw puzzle that Keisha was slowly putting together to form a complete picture. But there was plenty more she wanted to know. So, when the start of the school year neared, she'd asked if Hope would be joining the theater group, and learned that Faith had insisted they try this class next, making Keisha's course selection effortless. And here they were, at the end of the first of many hours they'd be spending together. What the hell? Omar said when the bell rang. I'm so confused. What does stretching have to do with dancing? I mean, my parents never do it, and you should see their moves. Just remember to bring a fresh pair of tacks tomorrow, Keisha said before walking over to join Hope, who was with her chaperone of a sister, so she adopted a new strategy and tried engaging with them both. What did y'all think? Keisha asked. Is this what you've been looking for? I know you've blown through gymnastics and cheerleading already, and you danced with us in the theater group. How does this compare? We'll see, Faith said. Stretching is boring. I didn't break a sweat. I liked it, Hope said, her smile demure. I think it'll be fun. When we get to the first routine, Keisha said, maybe we can practice together and pull ahead of the others. We'll work up a sweat like you want and lead the rest of the class toward greatness. She figured that would appeal to Faith's ambitious nature, and more importantly, Hope's desire to coach. We'll see, Faith said taking her sister's hand and leading her away. Hope glanced over her shoulder with a wince of apology as they went. Keisha smiled to assure her that it was all right, and it most certainly was, because if there's one thing she enjoyed, it was a challenge. Chapter 4, September 1st, 1993 Diego felt like an idiot when walking to his second elective of the day. Unlike the Spanish class he'd enrolled in, what possible use could it have? Once he opened his own auto repair shop down in El Paso, he'd need to be more fluent in Spanish than he already was, since a lot of his customers wouldn't speak English. Or have a lot of money, so maybe it wasn't the best business model. But that was fine with him. Diego didn't have any interest in fixing some rich guy's jaguar. He only wanted to deal with real people who owned normal cars. Because that's who he was, too. Fucking real. So why had he signed up for a class where a bunch of kids got together to play make-believe? Ridiculous. And yet, the people in the theater group were kind of cool. Diego had felt welcome around them. They acted like he was good at what he did and didn't seem fake like the characters they played. Hell, most of them never made it on stage, not to perform. They seemed happy to have a place where they actually fit in, even if that meant they had to sew some dopey curtains or paint a wooden cactus and weird shit like that. Diego realized he was walking faster, eager to return to that sense of belonging, before he reminded himself that nothing stayed the same. By now, they'd all have heard that he was a serial arsonist. Didn't matter that he'd only lit some toilet paper on fire after TPing a couple of trees. If he'd really wanted to burn down Graham's house, Diego would have gotten the job done. Nothing would be left but a pile of ashes. Instead, the house's exterior had merely gotten singed. But that didn't matter to people nor did the facts. Just like Omar's stupid garage that Diego had supposedly torched years ago, history was not only written by the victors, 
but spread far and wide to ensure the losing side could never win, no matter how hard you tried. He reached the auditorium door and braced himself for the fearful gazes and hissed whispers that awaited him on the other side, nothing he hadn't dealt with previously. Ricky, on the other hand, Diego was surprised to have gotten this far into the day without seeing him. That might be about to change. Ricky had written endless letters over the summer, many of them outlining various plans on how they could be together, including taking the theater elective. Diego had imagined doing exactly that, along with countless other scenarios, since it was the only way to immunize himself against the future. If he felt a small hand take his right now and turned around to see dark, wet eyes staring up at him in sympathy and need, that would be tough to resist. But only if he was taken off guard. So, while locked in a shitty institution, he had made himself picture all the different ways Ricky might try to force his way back into his life, even though it was torture. Such as lunch break, which had seemed the most likely opportunity for him to show up, but then... Diego! The voice cut straight to his heart, despite all the precautions he'd taken. When he saw the figure running down the hall toward him, Diego was struck by how much Ricky had changed. The mop of black hair was styled now, parted on one side. His arms and legs were lankier, even his face had matured, which was a timely reminder that nothing stayed the same. If he needed further proof of that, Ricky slowed and stopped when they were still six feet apart, he never would have done that before. Ricky would have slammed into him, grabbed hold, and refused to let go. But he too must have sensed that they'd parted ways three months ago in a manner that transcended the physical. I miss you, Ricky said, his voice sounding vulnerable because a question was hidden in that statement. He wanted to know if Diego had missed him too, which of course he had but feeling that kind of thing was a luxury he hadn't been able to afford when locked up with a bunch of psychopaths. Ricky swallowed at his lack of a response and tried again. Can we talk? The bell rang. He rushed past Ricky, and annoyingly, it fucking hurt. So what had been the point in imagining this moment so often? His plan hadn't worked. Diego felt like someone had drop-kicked his heart away. God damn it. He was so lost in thought that he had made it into the auditorium without being truly aware of his surroundings. There he is. Told you he'd join this year. So cool. Diego glanced around in confusion, including behind him, but Ricky was nowhere to be seen. They were talking about him. Hey, he said with an upward nod at a couple of guys who'd run the lights in the previous play. They looked at each other, as if needing guidance for how to respond, before saying, Hey, in unison. Diego cast his gaze across the rows of seats, which were only occupied toward the stage, although quite a few people were standing while talking. Keisha was one of them. She nodded in his direction, Diego close enough to read her lips when she said, Look who's here. Mindy turned around in her seat. Then her jaw dropped. He laughed, despite everything he was feeling inside. That's how it had gone all summer. He'd been in a hopeless place, and she had shown up like a delicate flower bursting through the concrete. So, of course, some asshole immediately tried to stomp on her. Diego had put a stop to that. Mostly for his own satisfaction, because Mindy was strong. She'd kept coming back, week after week, no matter how bleak the surroundings or how abusive the audience she had sat there in front of angry, fucked-up guys, including himself, and read a goddamn book. She must have felt like a piece of meat under all those sexually frustrated stares. Her flower didn't wilt, though. Not one bit. Mindy only seemed to grow taller and more beautiful with each visit. Diego realized he was smiling, which felt weird, so he stopped. She didn't. Mindy kept beaming at him. Okay, everyone, Miss Deville said, walking to the front of the stage. Let's get started. Her attention moved to the back of the room. Hurry up, I run a tight ship. Don't be late to my class. He glanced over his shoulder. Ricky had finally arrived, his eyes red around the edges. 
Diego shrugged off the sympathy that was nipping at him and chose a seat at the end of the row, a tiny, dark-skinned girl sitting on his left. No one would be able to sit next to him unless... Ricky settled down across the aisle from Diego, shooting furtive glances in his direction. For the first day, Miss Deville said, from a position of authority on the stage. I always like to explain what to expect from this class before giving you a chance to do the same. Diego listened half-heartedly. In his peripheral vision, he was aware of Ricky's stare. Rather than pretend he didn't notice, Diego turned his head and looked right at him. Better to get this out of the way now, for both their sakes. He was struck again by how much Ricky had changed. Although his apologetic expression was familiar, Diego had seen it during the painful drive home from the failed trip to El Paso. Ricky had kept saying how sorry he was, just not enough to actually go through with it. And it pissed him off, because they could have taken the whole damn world by storm. He realized he was scowling. Ricky swallowed, his eyes wavering, like he was going to cry right then and there. This was a bad idea. Getting to see Mindy's reaction had been worth it, but Diego wouldn't show up after today. What was the point? Okay, Miss Deville said. I'd like to hear from you now, one by one. Please introduce yourself and share what motivated you to take this class. Oh boy, maybe he should walk out right now. Although he was curious to hear what other people said. Hey y'all, my name is Keisha Hart. I enrolled in this class as a freshman because my best friend said it would be easy for us to hang out and gossip. I took two acting parts the first year, but figured out quick that I prefer working on the production as a whole. Last year I focused on choreography. This year I'm hoping to become stage manager. All I can say is, if you're new, stick around. There's plenty of variety. You'll find where you fit in soon enough. Keisha sat, the person next to her springing up. Hi, my name is Mindy Beaumont. I'm the one who wanted to gossip. As it turns out, you'll be way too busy for that. Unless you're sitting in my makeup chair, where I do love dishing the dirt. So I wasn't completely wrong. Diego snorted. The others laughed. I also do wardrobe, Mindy continued. At a certain age, you're supposed to stop playing with dolls, but this is the next best thing. Actually, it's even better. I can't wait to work with everyone again. Me neither, a blonde girl said, hopping to her feet to give Mindy a high five. My name is Whitney Brennigan Habersham. Try saying that three times fast. No, really. A chorus of jumbled syllables was the response. It's not actually that hard to say. Whitney said. I just think it's fun. Like this class. Last year, I got to be a princess who moved into a castle with some sort of crazy werewolf. Oh, and I got to sing and dance with a street gang. I can't believe this is part of school. It's hilarious. And so it went for most of the hour, Diego paying close attention, since many of the speakers had been kind and supportive to him last year, despite him being a stranger to the group. Before he knew it, his turn had come. Hey, Diego said, standing up. I'm here because... Oh, wait. My name is Diego, as in Gomez Auto Repair. That's not a weird hyphenated last name. It's the family business. There was a rumble of laughter, but not at his expense. I starred in a couple of plays last year, he began, only to be interrupted by applause. You guys are cool, he said when they quieted down. That's the main reason I'm here. And also because... He sought out Mindy. I had a really shitty summer, but someone went out of their way to make me happy. I figured it would make her happy if I signed up for this class. So yeah, here I am. Mindy was blushing, but she seemed pleased. He sat down, satisfied, until he heard a voice to his right. My name is Ricky Nishikawa, and, um... Diego glanced over just in time to see a trembling chin. I think I'm here for the wrong reason. Ricky rushed down the aisle and out the door, leaving a confused silence in his wake. I've got this, 
Mindy said. She shot to her feet and hurried after him. Diego sighed. This isn't how he'd wanted things to play out. He remembered returning to school after a shitty summer years ago, and the way his so-called best friends had walked away, leaving him to wonder what went wrong instead of having the decency to tell him to his face. He wouldn't do that to Ricky. Time for a do-over. When the bell rang not long after he left the auditorium, Mindy was farther down the hall talking to Ricky, who noticed him first, his face creasing in pain. Mindy followed his gaze before walking over. You really need to talk to him, she said, placing a hand on one of Diego's crossed forearms. He was a mess the entire summer. It was heartbreaking. Yeah, okay, he replied. Mindy's eyes were pleading with him. Be gentle. I'll be honest, Diego countered. See you tomorrow. At lunch, Mindy raced off before he could say otherwise. His gaze moved down the hall, where Ricky was watching him sullenly. Diego walked in his direction, Ricky looking more hopeful with each step. This was going to suck. Hey, Diego said, leaving it at that. Can we talk? Ricky asked. We already are. Ricky swallowed. I'm really sorry. Diego sighed warily. Are you? Yes. Uh-huh. So you wish you were in El Paso right now? Ricky shook his head. What? You said you were sorry, Diego growled. Prove it. We'll do it all over again. I'll drive you out to Candle Cave. We'll get my money. I'll fuck you, and then we'll hit the road right now. Let's go. Ricky hugged himself and leaned against the row of lockers for support. Well? Diego barked. What's it gonna be? I don't want to, Ricky said. Why not? Diego demanded. Be honest. You know I can take it. Ricky opened his mouth, then he closed it before trying again. I guess because... Yeah? Ricky swallowed. I wouldn't feel safe. I never feel safe. Diego snarled, his stomach twisting up with the truth. I've been on that road for years when you... You haven't even left your goddamn bedroom. But you will. Someday you'll look around and realize that you aren't safe and never were. Then it'll click. But I hope you're an old man by then. Because you have a good life. Your parents are both alive and sane. You get to go home to a nice cozy house each night. I envy you, but there's no turning back for me. I don't get to go home again. I'm on a one-way trip. So you did the right thing. All I can do is drag you down with me. But I won't, because it would ruin you, just like... His voice strangled to a halt, which pissed him off. There's nothing wrong with you, Ricky said. Diego grimaced. You know I hate well-meaning bullshit. You're not fucked up, Ricky cried. Sometimes I feel like you're the only one who isn't crazy. That's why I love you. No, Diego slammed his palm against the locker near Ricky's head and left it there. You do not get to say one thing and do another. Not to me. Ricky jutted out his chin. So I have to do exactly what you want. Or it means I don't love you? Diego leaned close, bringing their faces together to make him understand. I would have marched straight through the gates of hell if that's what you needed. In fact, that's exactly what I did. What about now? Ricky asked, his eyes catching fire. If you still love me, what about right now? Diego clenched his jaw, his eyes moving hungrily to Ricky's defiant mouth. <coughs> They turned their heads in unison. Principal Preckwinkle, a short woman with a mess of blonde curls, adjusted her glasses with a frown of disapproval. I hope we can avoid a repeat of last year's indiscretions, she snapped. I went out of my way to ensure that you wouldn't share any of the same classes. Must I also assign someone to escort each of you through the halls? 
See what I mean? Diego said, turning to Ricky. I'll only drag you down with me. He pushed away from the lockers and winked at Principal Preckwinkle before sauntering in the opposite direction. She obviously hadn't tried hard enough to keep them apart, unless Ricky had shown up in that class when he was supposed to be in another. She probably wouldn't notice or care. Preckwinkle was more interested in taking him down. Diego wished she would get it over with and expel him already. That way he wouldn't have to suffer the humiliation of being a sophomore when he was supposed to be a junior. He wouldn't have to see Ricky again, or figure out if he was going to sit with Mindy at lunch tomorrow, or take a role in another dumb school play. He could work on cars all day in peace and quiet. Nobody would bother him anymore. He'd be free. Disconnected. Alone. So why had he shown up today? How come he hadn't moved to El Paso? Nobody was stopping him. Diego thought of his mother, and of Mindy, and how people in the theater group had actually clapped for him, like he'd done something good for once. What if Ricky was right? Maybe running away was a bad idea. Fuck. Diego stopped and turned around, but the hallway behind him was empty. September 1st, 1993. The first day of her political career, and Sylvia already felt like throwing in the towel, mostly due to the company she was forced to keep. She continued to doodle in her notebook, her head tilted downward even when checking the corner of the room to collect embarrassing details. Troy Mitchell was standing next to Faith Song's desk, where she sat on the surface while slowly making out with him. And it was gross. Not just because he was a sleazeball who couldn't keep his hands to himself. At times, it was hard to look away, because Sylvia could swear she saw his tongue moving around in Faith's cheek, like she was sucking on a leech. Disgusting. She couldn't wait to tell Mindy all about it. Sylvia wasn't feeling much chemistry with the rest of the class either. She had expected to be surrounded by bookish people who humbled her with their knowledge of government policies. Instead, a group of girls near her were excitedly debating prom themes. The only other person she knew here was Dave, who she had met at a couple of parties last year. When she'd said hello to him, his response was muted before he took a seat next to Troy and Faith. Her attention returned to the couple in the corner. Troy was making mmm noises like Faith tasted good. So gross. Mindy had dodged a bullet. Sylvia had been fortunate, too, because Omar was a great kisser. She thought of the way he'd always pull back to smile at her, his eyes alight like she was the most beautiful woman in the world. She missed that. No, she missed him. Yes, they saw each other on occasion, usually with other people around but it wasn't the same as being together in his bedroom or out at the lake while fishing. You! Get off that desk! A heavy-set black woman had just marched in, her finger pointing at Troy before swinging to the far side of the room. And you! Go sit over there! Don't give me that look. I'm the vice principal. But, Troy said, I told you where to sit. Now move! Troy slunk to his corner. Okay, then, the woman said, standing in front of the teacher's desk. Most of you don't know me yet, but as you just heard, I'm your new vice principal, Laverne Fremont. Even though teaching falls outside of my regular duties, I felt it was important to establish this class. How your country is governed will color your entire lives, and it's crucial to understand the inner workings now so that you can prevent your voice from being diminished in the future. High school, as you'll discover, is a microcosm of the world you'll enter into as adults. You're here to prepare yourselves. I'm here to guide you. Um, a girl to Sylvia's left raised her hand. Vice Principal Fremont? Laverne will do, otherwise we'll be here all day. Oh. I think I might be in the wrong class. I thought we were going to plan the pep rallies and dances. You will, the vice principal replied. 
The Student Council, much like the United States government, has limited, albeit important, roles to play in the lives of its people. Let's go over them one by one. Sylvia perked up. This was more like it. She stopped doodling and started taking real notes. A lot had changed since this time last year. She had gone from not wanting to be noticed to... Well, she still wasn't eager for public scrutiny, mostly because of her undocumented parents, although she didn't worry about them as much lately. Not in the same way. Both of her parents were working for Keisha's family now, out on Heartland Farms. That meant driving away from Pride in the morning and returning each evening to a trailer park on the edge of town where they lived, reducing the likelihood of them being pulled over. Her parents were working for good people who wouldn't try to exploit them because of their immigration status. Sylvia's mother had, until the end of June, been employed as a maid at a cheap hotel. Her boss had never been timely when doling out paychecks. When her mother raised the issue with him, he had suggested that sleeping with him might help. That was the final straw. Her mother had quit. Now she went to work with her husband each day, so it was a happy ending for them and for now. All it took was losing their jobs and they'd be back to square one. Sylvia's family wasn't the only one dealing with these issues. She wanted to find a way to help and needed to decide on a career. So while smoking weed in the woods by her trailer, it had dawned on her that politics might be the answer. Not in the, hey, vote for me and I'll make all your problems disappear type of way. She was more interested in the people behind the scenes who created the rules instead of breaking them. By changing the system, Sylvia could protect her family while helping countless others in the same situation. None of you are elected officials yet, Laverne said. Tomorrow we will go over the student council positions and their parallels with the American political system. For now, she glanced at the clock, her timing impeccable because the bell rang. Congratulations on surviving your first day back at school. The classroom cleared out to the sound of discontented grumbles, although Sylvia noticed a few people, like herself, who seemed more awake than when the class first started. Two of them even remained behind to talk to the vice principal. Sylvia was too eager to get outside to the warmth and sunshine. She stopped by her locker first, almost expecting a camcorder to be shoved in her face while an over-enthusiastic guy raved about how great everything was going to be. She lingered for a moment, just in case, before leaving the building and unlocking her bike. She rode a short distance to the wooded lot next to the school and dismounted. Sylvia guided her bike along a narrow path until she was deep enough into the trees that she wouldn't be spotted easily. After glancing around to be sure, she dug around in her backpack and pulled out an old tin that used to contain mints. The only thing inside now was a joint that she'd rolled earlier and a book of matches. Sylvia lit up, and unlike the current president, she most definitely inhaled. The smoke carried a hint of menthol, infused by her choice of container. Maybe she should keep some actual mints in there to enhance the effect and to use afterwards so a customer wouldn't smell the pot on her breath. She only took a couple hits, since she needed to clock in, but it was enough that everything felt good. From the breeze on her skin to the sounds of the leaves rustling in the branches above, she became aware of the beauty of the world. Who needed a goofy guy to film such things for her? Lissai. Sylvia pushed her bike toward the street. She had just reached the sidewalk when she noticed someone standing there, peering into the trees. Oh, Ricky said. Sorry, I thought I smelled weed and thought Diego might be in there. You got one out of two, right? Sylvia said. Wanna get high? Ricky shook his head. I've tried. It's not my thing. Cool. Welcome back, by the way. I don't remember if I said that at lunch. Thanks. Ricky peered at the trees again with a troubled expression. I didn't notice anyone else in there, Sylvia told him. I'm guessing you never found Diego? I did, he replied tersely. How'd it go? Ricky's voice sounded hoarse when he responded. Do you know what it's like to spend three months wishing you could be with someone, only to find out that they want nothing to do with you? 
Yes. He blinked in surprise. You do? More or less, she said. Just before you left town, Omar broke up with me. He said he wanted to start over his friends and take things slow. Which was fine, but I thought we'd get back together before too long. Imagine my surprise when, while at work, I happened to see him walking down the sidewalk with Whitney Arm and Amber Baking Soda, or whatever her name is. Ricky snorted and laughed. Sylvia joined him. She seems nice, and it's not like I can complain. I had my chance and blew it. Ricky winced. Sorry about that. I kind of ruined everything for you. She shook her head. It's not your fault. Yeah, it is. If I'd promised to keep a secret, then you wouldn't have blackmailed me. And Omar wouldn't have gotten so upset. I'm the one who kissed Keisha, Sylvia said. And the one who kept secrets from him. I only have myself to blame. Ricky sighed. I know the feeling. She eyed him a moment. I have to get to work, she said. But if you're heading that way, we could keep talking. Sure. Can I ride on your handlebars? Sylvia chuckled at the visual image. She was definitely feeling that weed. You've gotten a little too big for that, she said as they began walking. So anyway, what happened when you saw Diego today? Ricky rolled his eyes. He lectured me about how he's from the wrong side of the tracks and that I should stay away. Classic, Sylvia said, and very hot. It is. Ricky replied. I shouldn't joke about it, though, because I really hurt his feelings. I don't think he'll ever forgive me. Diego is the type to hold a grudge. I tried getting him to be friends with Anthony and Omar again, but it didn't work, and their feud started years ago. If he's still mad at them after all this time... That's rough, Sylvia said in sympathy. I'm sorry it didn't work out. But I'm sure you'll find someone new. Maybe we should put personal ads in the school newspaper. That's not really a thing, but they'd be fun to write. Ricky was staring at her incredulously. I'm not giving up. Are you? Sylvia shrugged. Omar is dating someone else now. So? That doesn't mean you've already lost. It's possible to have feelings for more than one person at a time. You know that. She certainly did, but the girl Sylvia had the hots for was chasing down a different lead. Diego has been abandoned by people his entire life, Ricky continued. He thinks I'm one of them, but I'm going to prove him wrong. You shouldn't give up on Omar, either. He's a really great guy. And funny, Sylvia said longingly, and sweet, and handsome. And he's got a big you-know-what. Ricky said with a naughty grin. Sylvia laughed. That's right! We've both slept with him! Did you guys ever go all the way? Sylvia shook her head. I wasn't ready. I wish I could have met him this year instead. But then, I'm not sure if I would have changed this much. Not without meeting him first. Omar was good for me. I feel the same way about Diego, Ricky said even though he's convinced the opposite is true. So, is it a deal? What? Are we going to get them back? Ricky took off his glasses to polish them. We could come up with plans and help each other out. She thought about how good it would feel to spend a lazy Sunday afternoon fishing with Omar again. Okay, why not? We should at least try. Yes, Ricky said, grinning when he returned his glasses to his nose. This is going to be great. Sylvia matched his expression. I know someone who can help us. He understands Omar better than most people. Diego, too, I bet, since he's been their best friend. You mean Anthony? Sylvia nodded. He's stopping by the record store soon. Cameron will probably show up, too. Come hang out with us. Awesome. Ricky glanced at her bike. You know... I bet I actually could fit on the handlebars. Sylvia laughed and swung a leg over it to get seated. Let's find out. 
The story continues as an audiobook, ebook, or paperback available at your favorite retailer.